you fix everything, right? I do. I know. You actually, what you're actually asking me to do is actually reverse that, is actually extract right. what is technically NLP versus what is technically hypnosis Correct. or other forms of influence. Correct. The truth is, is that at a, at a, everything is influence, period, end of story. But if you can think of NLP, I like the way Richard puts it. Uh, it's the study of the structure of successful thinking. Hmm. Mm. So anybody, you know, another thing he says is think about if you could custom design the inside of your brain the same way you customize a room in your house. Okay. So what does that really mean? It means that as a human being, we have certain programs and certain processes that we do that are kind of established when we're born at random and by default course of our life. Mm -hmm. What NLP seeks to do is to look at people who are ultimately successful at a given task or area of endeavor, figure out how they do it internally and externally that gives them that result, and then teaching it to others. To extract that, you have to understand the certain tools that NLP likes and embraces, one of which is the structure of thinking. Your thoughts have a structure. Those structures tend to be based on the five senses. Visual, auditory, olfactory, kinesthetic, gustatory. The order and sequence in which you go through those different elements of your thoughts creates a structure of how your, your internal thought or subjective experience is created. Now, within those visual, auditory, kinesthetic, olfactory, and gustatory modalities, as the NLP likes to put it, you have sub-modalities. These sub-modalities are actually what change the subjective experience. They're the coding system by which we make finer and finer distinctions in our thoughts. They're the structure of our thoughts. If you're talking about the visual modality, you may be talking about things like, if you're looking at a picture, is the picture moving versus still? Is it in color versus black and white? Is it three dimensional or really sharp? Very good. Is it, are you, as you see the image, are you in the image, or are you looking at it as if you're looking at it through your own eyes? We call that associated versus dissociated. How big is the picture that you're making? Is it big, is it small? And of course, one of the big ones for most of us, because we're, we're neurologically hardwired for this, is how close is it? or how far away. Now there are many more submodality distinctions we could make. This is just within the visual reference. We have auditory references, we have kinesthetic references, we have olfactory and gustatory references. It is the constellation, the groupings of these submodalities that determine the structure and therefore how our nervous system encodes that experience. Gustatory, uh, the last one. Gustatory. Gustatory is that taste. Okay, hold on. All right. Just wanted to make sure. Some things leave a bad taste in my mouth. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing I understand is that the structure, or the, I don't know if he likes to call these strategies. These are sequences of visual olfactory, kinesthetic olfactories. Uh, Circuits are chains of, of representations that create a specific outcome. Okay. Where am I going with this? Um, so the submodalities determine the meaning, the strategies determine the result.
cool thing about this is that we can change these. And when we change these, change the we change how our nervous system encodes and responds to the experience. If we understand how one person does a certain thing and we understand the mental, physical, and emotional steps that they go through, we can take that model and teach it to you and install it in you and install it in you so that you can do the same thing, so that you can have the same results the champions do. Whoosh. Gotcha. So, if you're going to learn NLP, this is what we call the understanding the, stu the, stru the study or the structure of subjective human experience. Now, as you go through this, there will be certain things that will have, tend to have more amplitude and impact than others. But, by and large, it's the submodality distinctions that make the whole process go. Make sense? If we're going to install things, we need to have this as the software. Right? But using what we call the Milton model, which is basically hypnotic language, we learn to install or make changes, either, either directly or indirectly. Using another process called the Milton model, we learn to elicit information. Because there's three basic processes that all human beings go through as their creating their internal experience. Those are deletions, distortions, and generalizations. So, in essence, these three processes create meaning within us. And when we communicate with people, we have to make our communication more streamlined. And this is one of the this is the process we engage in. We delete certain things, we distort certain things, and we generalize. Okay? When we start applying the Milton model, we ask we target certain structures or certain kinds of questions, categories of questions in the language that indicate that something has been deleted, distorted, or generalized. And then using this, the questioning process, we recover that information so that we know what to change. That make sense? Thank you. Okay. No model we can install or shift. I'm sorry, nothing. Yeah, no model we can install things or shift things around. The meta model, I'm sorry, I broke it up twice. My bad. This is the meta model. Okay? Meta model, we extract information, we get to the we find out what's really going on, how they're actually doing something on the inside of their head. So we understand the structure, so we understand the process they're using. And that's the secret, or the big secret behind most NLP style interventions is that it's more concerned with the process or the structure of what they're doing much more so than the story of what or how or why they're doing it. Okay? We don't care why they're doing it. Pre basic presupposition of NLP is that you're not broken. You're just doing stupid shit. Okay? If you're doing if you're thinking a certain way that's producing a certain result that you don't want, change it. Okay? So we're gonna teach you how to think and Richard likes to make a distinction. We're going to teach you the difference between thinking and remembering. Because most of the time we confuse the two processes. Right. We look at a situation and all of a sudden we have a memory from when we were 12 and apply it to the situation we're in. We're not thinking. Mm -hmm. We're remembering. We work at one time and then we rub to our brain, brain just take brain. it on and say, hey, it worked once. So because your brain is designed to make things familiar. It looks at a situation and it categorizes familiar, unfamiliar, familiar, unfamiliar.
familiar? Okay, what did we do in the past? Now you're remembering. So that's where your generalization comes in. That's one of the basic things. And, and there's many, many, many Milton or meta model distinctions that you can make. What you'll discover is that the Milton model and the meta model are the inverse of each other. Right. Mm -hmm. The Milton model is about vagueness, it's about being specifically vague. Whereas the meta model is about eliciting specificity, getting more and more specific. Okay? Now, you have to be careful because when you go meta on people, you run the risk of what we call becoming a meta monster. Meta modeling people tends to break rapport because mm -hmm. people do not want to think about thinking. It's the specific. It's mm -hmm. They don't want to go there as a rule. So when you do it, you have to be very soft. If they have the uh, the meetup, we talked about softening your language, and you have to have a huge rapport skills. Okay, that's why we spend so much time on state control and rapport. The deeper the rapport, the easier you can use the meta model without creating animosity or defensiveness. And the other part is you have to learn that um, there's a tremendous amount of what we call sensory acuity. And calibration that goes into being effective as a neurolinguistic program. I read in your book uh, the other night, you was trying to go through the calibration, and you said you might well forget anything, or everything is a shotgun approach if you don't have calibration. Mm -hmm. So, can you so you say that? So, I understand that it's, it's is it just literally adjusting slight adjustments, or how, how, do, you, how do you recommend calibrating everything? Maybe how do you calibrate deviance? How do you measure change? Do comparison, I guess? Comparing it to what? What you were before. Uh, so you need to establish a baseline. You have to establish a baseline measurement by which you can measure change. Okay. So NLP, as I, again, the study of successful thinking. Mm. The original definition was the study of the structure of subjective human experience. You say that to someone, they go, huh? I'm going to teach you how to think better so you can custom design your, the inside of your head to think what you want to think, the way you want to think it, so that you can get the things you want in life. Okay. okay. I consider it a subset of hypnosis. There are many who would disagree. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or you can, most people, especially people who come through the neuro-linguistic programming side of things first, they look at hypnosis as a subset of NLP. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, who's right? Yes. Mm -hmm. right. It's simply another way. Looking at it, yeah. mm -hmm. But these things are real phenomena. It's what we do neurologically to make meaning. And, as, and therefore, it is extremely useful as a way of doing making change. It might be unconscious. Well, most of this is all unconscious for all of you, until somebody teaches you that this is what you're doing. The whole field of psychology, there's this thing in NLP we call eye access and cues. See right here, I'm a visual, I'm an olfactory, I'm a gustatory. Okay, we just talked about BAK. Have we got this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to give you, a, you know, just a brief overview of some of the processes that we're going to, we're going to explore in the time that we have. And then we'll go from there. Maybe we'll teach you one or two techniques that you can play with. Okay. Okay. But when we talk about eye accessing cues, this is your eyeballs. All right. Generally speaking, up directions are accessing visual information neurologically. Okay. Horizontal movements signal auditory information. They're accessing auditory information. Kinesthetic. And some people say here auditory digital. The general rule I like to use is if it's going down, they're feeling something. Okay. Now, the other secret to this is that the words, the language that comes out of our mouth, is a direct representation of how we're structuring our thoughts. So if someone says that's downright mean, 
What they're literally telling you is, spatially, that information is stored down and to the right. If something leaves a bad taste in my mouth, their internal experience is such that they're using a gustatory structure to process that information. Wow. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. The dance of the eyes up to down to left to right will indicate the strategy that a person is using. You cross-reference that with the well, that's not really the representation of a mouth. But you cross-reference that with the words that come out of their mouth and the gestures that they use to create a model or an elicitation of their strategy. Okay? So some people will do it strictly through the words that come out. Some people will watch eye accessing patterns. Some people, depending on what system you're trying to work through, will look at where people are gesturing or how they're using their hands. You'll see a lot of people say, like, something in my feet, I just can't get past it. And you'll see this. What are they doing? They're literally tracing where it is, how big it is, and the direction it's moving. Okay? These aren't random. Okay? So they're giving you all of this information, but because you don't realize it's information, right. you don't pay attention to it consciously. Right. I, turn, I still turn it off. I have to remember to put it on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The ability to, to do all this at the same time or as Joyce is called uptime. It's a way of turning up your awareness and sensory acuity. Sensory acuity is the ability to perceive these things. Calibration is the ability to interpret. Does that make sense? I'm trying to give you a brief intro to all. Yeah, yeah. Does it, is this making sense and putting things in a, in a perspective for you guys? Mm -hmm. okay. Now, I mean, just the concept that everyone's gestures are connected to something is pretty interesting. So some modality. You never considered. You never considered that no, possibility. Not really. It's huge. Never considered that. It's huge. I, mean, I won't go too far into your session. When you came to me for a session. You were doing that left and right, mm -hmm. all over the place. So I built that into my intervention. It's easy to see when you're working with people in a session because that you're supposed to be on observing all mm -hmm. those things at the time. It's harder when you're out and about and you're just in your own modes. And, and that's one of the big things that you need to understand. Most hypnotists, most neurolinguistic programmers, their skills are, are, are way too complex dependent, are context dependent, right. to be useful outside of it. Right. They can't. It's not with them everywhere they go. So you have to consciously take the skills into other contexts and be willing to suck at it first before you become really good at it. Become cross-contextual in your influence. Okay? Now, um... Now what about, I mean, people, once you have that understanding and you're talking to them, you're not only using, when you say, what, I'm talking to someone now, I'm starting to use their model mm -hmm. where it, it switches. So then if someone's observing me and they're trying to do that, that's it's not necessarily going to be, like, it's just easy if someone doesn't know because you can get all that information, it's unconscious, but the minute you're working with somebody who actually has that and you're trying to communicate with them, are they, I mean, they're still going to have it, it's just going to be on a smaller Depends scale. Depends on the context and, what, how, and how subtle you are with it. That's the whole point about killer influence and CPI, is to show you how to make it functional without calling attention to it and yet still having the impact. Okay. But you can, in fact, be very blatant with some of this stuff, as long as you're congruent and sincere. Report with every with report everything is possible. Outside of it, very challenging. Unless you have tremendous personal power, which Richard has in abundance, and honestly, it's worth cultivating. Okay. If you have both, you're pretty much unstoppable. Okay. Um, what do you, what, how do you define personal power? The ability to say something and have it happen. The ability to make a decision and manifest it. Okay? The, the, 
ability to make a statement and have so much credibility and so much certainty and authority that the yeah. unconscious responds to it. Okay, it goes back to certainty is always what it's about. Okay. Which is one thing that our particular approach develops much more so than probably any other system I've seen because it's the driver. Okay. You find that um, there's a lot of magic formulas in NLP, but without certainty and without um, that's what I'm looking for. I'll come back to me in a minute. But, um, yeah, I'll come back to that. So, um, so what else you want to know about NLP? It's a good start. Okay. Um, good start. 